Okay, great. And uh, keep an eye on info in case there's any people, please. Does that make sense? Yes, total. Sense. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll see you um, around 8.30. 8.30, okay. Thanks a lot. Yay.
Hey Joe, how's it going? Hey there, good. Hey, just do a quick sound test. Okay, so test, test. Sounds good. Good. Test, test. Sounds good. Okay. Test, test. And sounds good. Okay, great. Thank you. And. I hear the tap. Thank you. I hear the tap. Good. And do you hear any echo? No echo. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for joining me, everybody. We'll begin shortly, a few minutes. Thanks for being here. Yay for the swimmer. Yay. Okay, Joe, I'll see you in a bit.
it was opening night. Yay! And I knew, I knew it was going to go well. I had a terrific cast. It was a story that came straight from my heart. Something very personal about when I was young and in love. And the previews had gone great. Each preview better than the last. It was a tremendous preview process. I knew, I knew that we had a hit. An incredible hit on our hands. And I really needed one. I mean, it was November of that year, and the year had been awful, which is weird because the year had started out so wonderfully. Even as far back as January, it, it was great. It was a wonderful year. And then it all started going south. Precipitously, quickly. All right, let me back up. Let me set the stage. Back up, two years. I was working at the theater's office trying desperately to keep the theater going, trying anything I could to keep it going. It was going down the drain. I felt like I was washed up. I felt like in six months the gig would be up. I was the only person left working at the theater in this tiny office. That was it, just me pecking away at the computer all day long. I was the development director. I was the executive director. I was the artistic director. I was the finance in charge of everything director. It was insane. Oh God, I felt like such a failure. Like, what would I be doing in six months? I'd be out of a job. And then, all of a sudden, the phone rang. And I answered it. Hello? Oh my God. It was the university. The university. Now, listen, I had been sending the university resumes and proposals for 10 years. I kept telling them, you know, I can do anything. I can, I can uh, direct. I can teach acting, theater history, playwriting. I can teach directing. I can write and direct plays with huge casts, with tons of students. And I can do anything. And they never gotten back to me, ever. Not a thing. And then all of a sudden, here they were. They were calling me up and... They wanted me to teach a class. I couldn't believe it. I was saved. If I could teach this class well, I'd get another class. And then maybe I'd get some sort of job security. I'd be at the university, which was fat with money. And then I'd be set. I'd have insurance. I'd have retirement. I wouldn't have to worry so much about the theater. It was incredible. And I mean, I was kind of wondering why they suddenly called me after 10 years of sending them my stuff. And I figured it out. Yeah. It was May. And this class was coming up in September and probably everybody else on the planet had said no. They'd gone through 50 resumes, but here's the thing, mine was the 51st and they called me up. And here's the thing, here's my advice. Always send in your resume, right? Because you never know. There might be 49 people who just can't do it or don't want to, but then you'll be there. This was great. And of course, I acted all cool about it, right? I was like, um, you yeah. I really need to think about it. Let me look at my schedule and I'll get right back to you. I mean, thank you. Thank you. This is great. But uh, I'll be right back in touch with you. I promise. Yeah, I just have to look at my schedule. Yeah. Okay, good. And I hung up and I waited about 15 minutes and then I called them back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'd love to. I'd love to. I'd love to. I'd love to. And so I did. I taught acting for two years at the university. Oh, it was wonderful. I rode my bike there every day. Oh, of course I didn't really ride my bike. I just liked having the bike because it was cool. I'd put it on Muni and take it down to Bart, then put it on Bart and go over to the East Bay and then ride up the little tiny hill to the school. And then I'd ride down the hill at the end of the day and put it on Bart. Then, you know, I didn't ride it home because I lived at the top of the hill. So I'd like put on Muni and did it, you know, but it was so cool riding the bike and it went so well. It went incredibly well at the university and I got really good evaluations from the students. And you know what? Everybody in the department really admired me. They admired me. I mean, they totally fell for my artistic director act. They thought that we were incredibly successful at the theater. I mean, they didn't know what our finances were. They just saw what they read in, you know, online, you know, about how great all the stuff we did was. They had no idea. And so I was like this, this glamorous artistic director teaching acting. And I was a great faculty member. Oh, I was the best. I went to all the faculty meetings and I never said anything. I never had any long monologues. I would just once in a while crack a joke. And I went to all the student productions because I love watching students on stage. They've got so much energy, so much life. I just love it. And I would stay afterwards and I'd congratulate all the students and congratulate the directors. And I was a great faculty member. And at the end of my first year, they asked me to give the commencement speech. Oh, God. 
That felt great. I was so honored. I would give the commencement speech at graduation. And I worked on it really hard. I based it on LBJ's uh, commencement speech at the University of Michigan, right? The Great Society. And I talked about the Great Society would be brought about through culture. And these were the makers of the Great Society, the students graduating here, your kids. You had done it. You made them possible. And they were going to give us the Great Society. The chair of the department praised me when he read it. He said, good work, excellent. And I got up there and I had on my big gown and you know my square hat, the mortar board or miter board or you know, Morrison hat clappy thing with the, you know, with the with the tassel and you know, all that, all that super gay stuff that you wear at graduation. And I gave the speech and afterwards I went out into the lobby and I shook hands with the parents. I said, congratulations, you're you should be so proud. Your kid did so well at this great university. And the weird thing was, was none of the faculty came up and thanked me. I mean, they, none of them even came up and, 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 you know, talked to me afterwards. I mean, you know, I thought maybe my, one might come up and say, you know, that was a lousy speech, but thanks for doing it. You know, but nothing. Silence. I guess I should have taken that as a warning. I don't know. I don't know what the, what, what had happened. But then they asked me to write and direct a play. And I think the reason they loved the play that I proposed was I was going to put 40 students on stage and that'd be great. They'd get all the students involved in a real production. And I did it. I couldn't pass up the chance. It was great. It was like a real spectacle. And yes, it was controversial. I mean, so much of the stuff I do is controversial. That's nothing new. But I think the real problem was I got too much attention. There was too much focus on me for too long a period. And then all of a sudden, that was it. It was over after two years. I mean, they asked me to teach summer school, which is great. I mean, I love summer school because, you know, the students have come from all over the world. and They have all these like different perspectives on things. It's really unique and exciting to work with such a variety of students, but it is considered sort of a step down. And then there wasn't even any more summer school. I was just out. And I thought, oh God, it made me feel terrible. Like, I don't know, I had not played the game. I should have just gone there and taught my classes and relied on the good response from my students, right? And I loved working with the students, but no, I, I was like a kid in the candy shop. I was like, oh yeah, I'll give the commencement speech. Oh yeah, I'll direct a play. I should be like, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm much too busy to do the commencement speech, but thank you. Or, I'm sorry, I've got too many projects in San Francisco to work on. I, I can't direct the play, sorry. But I just couldn't resist. I just was like, gobble, 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 gobble. I'd blown it. I'd blown it. I should have kept a low profile. That's why I was so angry at myself. I didn't play the game. I failed. I hadn't been politic. So it was back to that little office. And of course, I've been working there for two years. And when my fortunes rose at the university, weirdly, the theater's fortunes rose. But now they were sinking again. And they were worse than they'd been two years before. And I was back working at my desk, frantically trying to save the theater. My one and only job now. And then I went to the doctor because I had this big bump in my lower abdomen. It was like horrifying and it hurt. I thought I had cancer. And he said, oh, no, no, it's, it's just a hernia. And I said, hernia, what's that? He said, oh, it's just, you know, your tissue is thin and, you know, we have to sew it up. We have to put in a mesh. I said, is it bad? He said, no, no, it's minor surgery. I said, well, why is it? Is it because I've been overeating? He said, no, no, we don't know why it is. It could be a genetics. It could be that you've been lifting too many heavy things. We just don't know. But I didn't believe him. So I went online and I looked up what my weight should be. You know, you put in your height and your age. And they give you like a, a range of weights for your height and age. And I was in the range. I, I was relieved. I was in the range. I mean, uh, I, here's the low end. Here's the high end. I was like up here at the high end. In fact, I was banging my head against the high end. I mean, desperately. But okay, I was in the range. But you know what? Those, those ranges, those are for Americans. They are very generous to Americans. Like Americans eat too much. So it's like, you know, the range is all skewed. You know, right? Because if you're anywhere near up here, you are in trouble. Even if you're back here on the low end, you should be there. You're in trouble. And I knew, I knew that I was in trouble. And I said to the doctor, I said, it must be because I eat too much or something. I mean, when I have a big, heavy meal, it really hurts down there. And he said, no, we just don't know. And I think, again, they're just being nice to us. Just being nice to Americans. 
So I had to go in for surgery, and it was not a big deal. I mean, you know, hernia surgery is not big. They said, we'll just give you a local anesthetic, okay? Not general, local. But sure enough, they like zapped me, knocked me out. I woke up later, I was flying like a kite. And the second the pain started kicking in, I took the tablets, the codeine, and I became like a junkie on the codeine, and you know? And I felt terrible, and I felt high and terrible, and my body was gross, and I'd never had any kind of surgery or been in the hospital again. I felt like I'd failed. And I couldn't go to the bathroom. I was totally constipated. And it was driving me crazy. So, you know, I, I took some castor oil, you know? And it, you know what castor oil is like? It's like dirt. It's like, you know, it's like drinking dirt. Not, not mud. That has some liquid in it. It's like drinking dirt. And it went down and nothing happened. I was just standing there waiting for something to happen. Nothing. So my husband and I, Michael, we went out for a walk and we got about an hour from home and then all of a sudden, <laughs> boom. Oh! I was in pain, it hit me. And there was gonna be an accident all over San Francisco if I didn't get home. So we fly to cab and we raced home and I was <laughs> Finally, I got relief, but I felt terrible. Emotionally, I was down. Financially, I was down. Job-wise, I was down. Physically, I was a mess. It was a bad time. And I had to do something. I had to bring myself out of it. I didn't know how, but I had to bring myself out of it. And so I decided, yeah, like a true American, I'll spend some money. But you know, we don't really like to buy anything. We just like to go on trips. And we couldn't afford a trip right then, but we could afford it with credit cards. Yeah, I had all these credit cards. I've been like gobbling them up every time somebody offered. I just got them. I never did anything with them. And I would put this whole huge trip on my credit cards. I could never pay it off, but I could pay like the monthly, maybe. So I would do that. And we were planning a big old trip to Italy. And you know, Michael and I, we have the best time together. We are so happy to spend time together. But if we can take a big trip, that's even better. So now we flew off to Rome. We were in Rome. There we were. Oh my God, I loved it. Because I'd studied ancient history, you know, as an undergraduate. And here I was in the center of it all at the Colosseum. Oh, you see, I don't... I'm just a tourist. I just like to do tourist things. I don't want to like speak Italian and get to know Italians. I, you know, that's not my interest. I just like to do touristy things. And we went to the Colosseum in the middle of Rome and there it was. And I just loved it because I've been reading all these books about it. And I just love imagining like, you know, lions eating Christians and Christians eating lions and everybody eating everybody else and gladiators and, you know, Charlton Heston and Stephen Boyd, especially Stephen Boyd, you know, like, you know, gladiators. I know they didn't do it there. It was like in the Middle East somewhere. But anyway, it's, 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 and I loved it. It was great. We had the best time in Rome. And then we went to Orvieto and saw the Signorelli murals, the frescoes, and we had like like shaved truffles and wine. And we went to Florence and saw everything. And one day we went to Pisa and we saw the American tourists, you know, acting like they're holding up the Tower of Pisa so their kids can take pictures of them. And then we were headed back from Pisa and we got on the wrong train. And it ended up stopping at a place called Luca, which we read all about. And I thought, oh great, let's get off and go to Luca. Luca was amazing. It was like the antithesis of the Roman Colosseum experience because Luca has the ghost of a Colosseum. It's got like a haunted Colosseum that's not there. Look at that. That shape is their arena, their Colosseum, but it's gone. There's nothing left. There's just these houses around it. It was so interesting to see that. And the guidebook said there is nothing left of their arena, nothing left of their Colosseum, nothing. But that's not true. If you look on the outside walls of those apartment buildings, look. Look, artifacts, yeah, parts of the Colosseum. Oh, it was amazing. And we ate huge meals the whole time. We had pasta with clam sauce and piles of red and green sauce and bread and tiramisu. And we had champagne with every meal. And then like, uh, Prosecco, we had Prosecco. It was great, we sat outside. You see, because I'm like 115th Italian or something, I don't know what. So I have it in my blood to eat all this pasta. It was great. We were just pigging out and seeing all these great sights. It was an amazing trip. And I saw it as like a tribute to my daddy because uh, the last time we'd gone to Italy, it turned out he died while I was away. It was sudden, nobody knew. And I just got an email before we were supposed to come on, on the plane and it just sort of colored the whole trip. 
And so this was, this was a, a tour in tribute to him to get Italy back for me. It was magical. And on the last day we were in Venice, we went out to Murano to see the, um, the blown glass, right? And we had pasta and we had Prosecco and tiramisu all day long. It was great. And the next morning we got up to take that long flight home and I felt disgusting. I felt so sick. My body was like, Bleh. My head was just this big balloon of snot, you know, it was like dribbling out and I had all this pressure and like a headache. I felt grotesque. And that's how I felt all the way home. And I was like, oh my God. I was on that flight feeling so disgusting. And I thought, you have got to clean up your act. You cannot solve your problems by spending all this money and eating all this food. It's disgusting. And this, this weird thing had happened in Rome. I hadn't really even processed it. I was, um, you know, I wear jeans all the time, you know, because, you know, I, I love jeans. They're easy, right? And I wanted to have nice blue jeans to go to Italy because I wanted to be like the, the American with the nice blue jeans. So I bought a new pair of blue jeans and I was putting them on one morning and I was putting my belt through the loops. And I said to Michael, I said, it's so stupid. Levi's just added a new loop. Why would they do that? And Michael said, well, I don't think they add new loops to all the pants. I think they just added a new loop to the pants you bought. I said, why? He said, well, they're probably bigger. And I thought back. 12 months before, I'd been wearing a 32, which is what I wore like for years. And then, you know, a couple months after that, I sort of, you know, got a 34 to be more comfortable. And then for this trip, I went online and bought new jeans. And I didn't even remember the size I bought. And I looked at the jeans I was wearing, they were size 38 which meant that in six months, I put on six inches. I had to do something. Monday morning, I got up. I coasted down the hill on my bike. I went to the office and it was the same situation, back, struggling, trying to figure out the theater, trying to make the theater work. How could I make it work? How could I make it succeed? And when work was over, I got on that bike. And I pedaled over to the Embarcadero YMCA. I walked off my bike, I got off, and I bought a membership for a year. I brought a swimsuit with me. I went up to the locker room. Locker rooms terrified me. I hadn't been in a locker room for like 30 years. I think they're the most horrifying thing. And I went into the locker room and I got into my swimsuit. I couldn't even believe I was doing this. It was like appealing to all my anxieties about anything like, you know, exposure or, you know, taking control of your life. I thought it was a complete fallacy. But I got into my swimsuit and I went in to the pool. I went to the slow lane and I lowered myself into the slow lane and there I was and I started swimming. I swam 40 laps. I just kept swimming and swimming and there was this Russian man next to me, right? And he kept stopping and saying to me, it's low, it's slow. I said, it's low, it's slow. Like I was going too fast, me? I couldn't believe it, but I kept going. I kept going in the slow lane, 40 lanes. And when I was done, <sighs> my body was in shock. It didn't know what had hit it. I didn't know what I'd done to myself. I just forced myself to do this incredible thing. I dragged myself out of the pool. I had no more locker room anxiety. I went into the locker room and I could just barely breathe. I think the only reason I was moving is because my brain was telling me I had to move. I could just hang out in a swimsuit at the YMCA for the rest of my life. I had to get dressed and go home. I can't say I felt better. I just felt like I was stinging all over the place. My body was in shock. My skin felt like it was a little bit on fire, which I found out later had something to do with the chlorine and me getting used to it. It was a new type of chlorine. So I put my shoes on and I got all my stuff, my backpack, and I walked out to my bike. And again, my body didn't know what I was doing. It was just my brain guiding my body. It was just in shock doing what my brain told it to. And I was gonna do what I always do. I was going to put my bike onto the muni bus and that would take me home, right? You know, because I didn't want to deal with that hill. So I started riding to the muni stop and 
Next thing I knew, I was riding up Market Street, and then I was riding home. I didn't even think about it. I mean, my body felt so funky from the swimming that I just didn't even think, and I rode all the way home, and I didn't even notice. So why swimming? Why did I chosen swimming? I always loved the water. I did. When I was a kid, I used to love going over to friends' houses and hanging out in the pool all day. That's all I wanted to do. And I'd go to the racket club with my mommy and splash around. And whenever we went on a trip, my husband Michael and me, we, we, you know, if we could, we'd stay near the beach and I'd go out in the water and swim. I just, I felt like I was disappearing into something. Like I was in a safe place, like I was just out in space. You know, they, they say that people spend millions of dollars to go into outer space, but they can just spend four dollars at the local city pool and feel what space is. And with my body being so blah, it was a wonderful place to be because it felt light and supported. I felt like I was back in the womb, completely safe. Tuesday, I got on my bike. I rode down to the office. I spent the whole day working, working, working. At the end of the day, I got on the bike and I rode to the gym and I swam. I kept doing my 40 laps. I was working on my breathing. I was trying to get better at it, better at it, trying to kick harder. Now, I was working on a new play and I had a thought while I was swimming that I wanted to use student actors. In other words, it was a play about college, about being in love in college. And it suddenly occurred to me, I should use like real college students, like, like students who had just graduated, right? And why not use my own students? Students that I knew. So I cast six actors in the play and they're all former students. A play of mine about being in love, young and in love. And they were great to work with these actors. They were not afraid of rehearsing a lot. They were really eager and excited, a professional opportunity. And I loved watching them work. And you know, it's funny because I was writing about myself, but when you use actors you know, you can actually use them a lot in the writing. And I use their personalities to make them as real as possible, to bring reality to the text. And I kept swimming every day between work and rehearsal. I swam, I swam. And it's like, I, I, my mind, I guess, felt better, but my, my body didn't really feel better, but it didn't feel bad. It didn't feel good, it didn't feel bad. And I realized that for a long time it had felt bad. It felt blah. And I can only describe my mental state as I, was, I would get into the water full of anxiety and fear and frustration. And I get out and it was like the slate had been wiped clean. I never had a bad swim. It was like an Etch-O-Sketch, you know? And you like fill the Etch-O-Sketch up with all the scribbles and then you take it and you like, you shake it and you got a clear Etch-O-Sketch. Or like shake and bake, you know? You drop the chicken in and shake it up and fresh chicken, brand new chicken, that was me. I was brand new chicken. In the middle of the day, I'd get a whole new start on life. A clean slate when I got out of the pool. It was such a bargain. I got two days for the price of one. You know, when you're writing a play and you're directing it and you're working with the actors, it's great because you can actually change the writing. You can actually adapt it to things that happen in rehearsal. And that's what I did with these actors because I thought they were so great. The lead guy and girl, they were so charming. Ben and Alex. Oh, God. Ben was so charming. You know, he was like a super young Tom Cruise. You know, Tom Cruise before any of us knew Tom Cruise. You know, like a 19-year-old. And I don't mean like 25-year-old Tom Cruise playing 19-year-old. He was like authentically 19. Magical. And Alex, she was radiant. She had this big toothy smile and this big beautiful face. And she would light up a huge stage. She would light up definitely our stage. She would light up like an amphitheater, like Epidaurus in the little night, just radiant. She was sunshine. They were great, those two. And they played, they played a gay guy and his best friend in college. And they showed us all of their romantic misadventures. It was great working with them and developing the script. And me, my days consisted of getting on the bike, and riding to work. Then getting on the bike and riding to the pool. Then getting on the bike and riding to rehearsal. 
Hmm. And then get on the bike and riding home. And that cast, they loved each other. They were so locked together. They had chemistry. And the first time we ran the show from beginning to the end without stopping, it was a delight. It was magical. I just sat there laughing the whole time. And of course, of course I was laughing. I wrote it, right? I mean, you know, I'd be like crazy if I didn't think it was funny. But the lighting designer, Anthony, was sitting next to me. And he was just smiling from ear to ear through the whole thing. And afterwards he said to them, he said, you guys, you guys are great. And I think he was just too shy to laugh out loud. So the next night, the next night was our first preview. Now a preview is not a performance. It's where you sell tickets for half price and it's sort of like a practice performance. And with a comedy, that's really important that before the critics come, before opening night, which is a really big deal, that you get some practice with the comedy. You find out where the laughs are. You find out where the energy needs to be dispensed, right? So we had our first preview and I was super excited. Mm, I was so excited for those guys. And the lights went down and then they came up on glorious Alex in the middle of the stage and she started her first monologue and for 90 minutes there was complete silence in the audience they didn't make one peep there wasn't a single laugh not one it was bizarre it's like the actors were great they'd done exactly what they'd done the night before in the run through which was totally enjoyable but the audience did nothing they were attentive but they didn't make a sound <sighs> afterwards i was horrified I mean, I, I didn't know what to say. I thought they'd come out of the dressing room all depressed, you know, but they didn't. They came out of the dressing room. It was so cute. They were so excited that they'd gotten through it in front of an audience without making a single mistake. They were so proud of themselves. And I, of course, was horrified. I mean, I thought, like, Jesus, what have you done? You've created this, like, total dud. I mean, everybody's going to be humiliated. But, I, you know, I didn't let on. I just said to them, because I remembered something. I remember that many years before I directed a big production of Guys and Dolls. At the first preview, it was a perfect performance, but the audience didn't laugh, not once. And it was because it was like a machine. It was just like a big machine happening in front of them. It had no life, even though it was perfect. And so I said to them, I said to the actors, I said, that was great. You guys nailed it. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Now you have to relax and enjoy it. You have to let it take care of itself. You have to let it, let it breathe. You have to trust that it's going to happen so that you can live it moment to moment. Next night, second preview. The lights went up and there was Alex in the middle of the stage and she started her first monologue and the audience started to giggle. And then the giggles became laughs and then the laughs just kept coming all night long. It was great. It was everything it should have been. And they didn't make mistakes. I mean, maybe one or two, but they lived it and the audience ate it up. The second performance was even better because the audience laughed, but they also started really listening to the characters and empathizing with them and feeling for them. There was a lot more emotion in the second performance. The third preview was phenomenal because you got all of the laughs, but also all the sadness, all the ennui of college love. It was great. And I thought, these guys are ready. They are ready for opening night. And that's where we were, opening night. And I was convinced, I was convinced it was gonna be the biggest hit I'd ever had. And I, like I said, I, I, I needed it. It had been a rough year from January to November. I felt like I'd been on a roller coaster, but here I was and I was so excited. And everybody was coming, all of our friends and well-wishers, the critics were coming, oh, so important. You gotta get good reviews, right? The biggest critic in town from the biggest paper was coming, right? And I was so excited and walking around making sure everybody was happy and got seated. And at five to eight, the critic from the big paper wasn't there yet. And at 8, he still wasn't there. And at 8.05, he still hadn't arrived. And I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And then he walked through the door and he sat down. I thought, oh, thank God we can start. Then the lights dimmed and they came up on Alex, radiant in the middle of the stage with her opening monologue. And for the next 10 minutes, people started trailing in late group after group after group trailing in late noisily and 
that stage. I mean, this is the way the theater is set up. There's the stage, right? And then there's the audience, okay? And in between them is an aisle. And anybody who arrives late has to walk on that aisle between the stage and the audience and then walk up the center aisle into the audience. In other words, they walk between the stage and the audience. So for, for the first 10 minutes, it was a series of things like this. Watch. Where are seats? Well, I didn't, do you know where our seats are? Oh, they're up here. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Group after group after group. Right there in front of the actors. You could not focus on the stage. The action just kept going on and on. And it was a constant distraction. 20 minutes into the show, a major funder, somebody from the city showed up 20 minutes late. He walked right up to me where everybody could hear and he said, John, I'm so sorry I'm late. I said, oh, it's all right. Thanks for being here. Sit down. The audience never got into it. After that first 20 minutes of confusion, they never caught up. It was excruciating. It was so hard to watch. The actors were so good. They were doing what they'd always done. All of the tenderness, the humor, the affection, the pathos, it was all happening. And the audience just sat there twisting, making noise, people getting up and down. It was excruciating. Uh, there, uh, like, it was so bad. Every once in a while, somebody would laugh. Somebody would actually laugh. And everybody else in the audience would like, look at them. It's not funny. Don't laugh. It was like weird. The energy was just completely off. And it was different from that preview because that audience was attentive. This audience was silent and not attentive. They never got synced with the stage. The actors gave a great performance. The audience gave a lousy one. And afterwards, I thanked everybody for coming. Thanks so much for being here. It's so great to see you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. I kept positive. But I was horrified at the moment that the actors would come out of the dressing room. And they started coming out one at a time. I said, that was great. You're such pros. You nail it every time. You're such professionals. Listen, we're going to have some champagne in the lobby opening night. Come out and join us. And then Alex came out. And I said to her, I said, Alex, you are radiant. You just light up that stage. That was great. And she said to me, John, we were crying backstage. Every time we came off from a scene, we were like crying because they weren't responding. And I thought to myself, you know what? This happens. <laughs> this stuff happens. I've done a lot of plays and sometimes opening nights do not... They never get started. And I said to her, Alex, that's why it's called live theater because sometimes the audience is dead. You did your job. You did a great job tonight. The audience, they didn't. They did a lousy job, but that's not your responsibility. You told the story, okay? Good work. I gave her a big hug and I said, come on out to the lobby, we're gonna have some champagne. But I knew, I knew what she was feeling. Because the first time it happens, you're like, what? And then you remind yourself, it's a living theater. Well, they had one more show that week, a matinee, and some other press came to the matinee. They couldn't come to opening night. And that was glorious. It was, it was perfect. It was, like, it was like they were just building on all the good stuff that came before. The audience laughed. They felt all sorts of sympathy. They were right there with the actors. It was like, it was a wonderful performance, right back where we were during previews. I was so proud of them. And they've been giving performances now for two weeks in front of paying audience. I was so proud of them. So I took them all out for pizza and beer at Goat Hall Pizza, right there on Petrero Hill. And I think I had a few too many beers because I got a little obnoxious, right? A little loud. And uh, I think they liked that. See the director let his hair down, right? <laughs> but that whole meal with the actors, I felt the sword of Damocles hanging over our heads. Because I knew on Monday morning, the next day, it was going to come down. That review in the big paper. I got up Monday morning, and I already knew the news was bad. Yeah, it had to be bad. Because, you know, the thing comes out online, the review, at like midnight, 3 a.m. And if it's any good, people send you emails congratulating you or text. I got nothing. I knew it was a stinker. 
And I thought, okay, well, that's all right. I still think the audience gave a bad show and that's really what's being reviewed, but okay, fine. But you know, it was my day off and I was self-righteous about that. I was gonna have a day off regardless. I was not gonna let this thing floating around out there, this review, bring me down. So I got on my bike and went on a big bike ride out to Stonestown. It was a great bike ride. And when I got there, I bought myself a new swimsuit. Yeah, at the sporting goods store. You see, I've been wearing like swim trunks, you know, like you wear to the beach. I never really bought myself an athletic swimsuit. And I put it on and I went to the Stonestown YMCA. So I'm a member of the Embarcadero YMCA, but I can use my YMCA pass anywhere in the city. So I went to the Stonestown YMCA. I got into my suit and I felt so official, like a real athlete all of a sudden. And I walked and I thought, oh, I'll weigh myself. You know, it's been a while and I stepped on the scale I'd lost 30 pounds. I couldn't believe it. The last time I weighed myself was during that whole thing where I was online, you know, like, and I was too high in my range, you know. I've been swimming for eight weeks and I'd lost 30 pounds. I, I was like, where was it? Where did it go? I was, it was like a total mystery to me, but I was like, yay, I could do it. I had never in my life realized that I could control my body. My whole life I'd struggled to control my emotions, control my creativity, control people's reactions to me. But the thing I never even tried to do was control my body. I just assumed it was impossible. And here, I'd done something that had fixed something and I was elated. I couldn't believe it. And then I thought I have to celebrate. I can't spend this day obsessing on that stinko review. I have to celebrate. This is a moment of, I knew what I'd do. There's that great story by John Cheever called The Swimmer, right? And in it, Nettie Merrill, he swims across the county, right? So he goes from swimming pool to swimming pool in people's backyards and he swims across the county that he lives in, right? And he, in between the pools, he portages. That's what he calls it. He swims a length and then he gets out and he portages the next pool and he swims all the way across the county. And he calls it the Lucinda River after his wife, Lucinda. And I decided I was gonna swim around San Francisco and I would call it the Michael River after my terrific husband, Michael. I would swim all the way from where I was at Stonestown to the theater at Petrero Hill because, you know, I had to go there and, and work on some stuff on the set, right? Just do some fix-its. So I would do it and I would swim all the way around. Like, you know how San Francisco is formed like this? That's how I would swim. I would swim the Michael River just like the character in The Swimmer. <gasps> I was so excited. So there I was. I was at the Stonestown YMCA and I got into the pool area and I dove into the pool and I swam a length. It was great. And I got out and I walked out in front of the YMCA and there it was, that glorious mid-century modern building with all those clean lines from 1953. The first leg of the Michael River. And then I got on my bike and I rode a couple blocks. I stopped my bike, I got off, and there I was at the Saba pool, the Saba public pool. Look at that, a glorious cement palace. Isn't that wonderful? From 2009, the architects are Mark Caballero and Patricia Taggart. How about that? Spectacular. Spectacular. Isn't that a luscious building? I went inside, I paid the $4 for the public pool, and I dove into that glorious pool. Look at that with those huge windows and all that space. And there was, a, there was like a, a children's water polo team in half the pool making all this wonderful noise. And you look at the windows and look at it. It's like you're in the middle of the forest. You're in the middle of San Francisco. You're on 19th Avenue, like the most crowded intersection traffic -y thing ever. And it was so wonderful. And I dove in and I just swam and swam and swam on the Michael River. And then I swam back out and I got out of the pool and I toweled off and I got on my bike and I rode to UCSF Parnassus campus. I parked my bike, 
I got off, I paid the fee, and I dove into their pool. Oh, such a wonderful pool from 1972. Ah, in the same building that has that wonderful Guggenheim parking garage that we went and saw last week. 1972, the whole structure designed by Reed and Tarix. Oh, such a luscious pool. And then I got out and I rode to the Richmond. I stopped, I parked my bike, I paid the $4 and I dove into the Rossi Public Pool in the Richmond. Look at that. Designed by one of our favorite architects, H.C. Bauman. Yeah, in 1956, it's one of the last buildings that he designed. Oh, it is so big and glorious. You know, most pools are like 25 yards long. This is like 40. It's just this weird length and it's got so much energy in there with all the families. It is great. Then I got back on the bike and rode up to USF. I stopped the bike, I paid the fee, and I dove into the Corette Swim Center. Look at that from 1989, John Fluger architect. The Flugers built USF, and this pool is glorious. This is the biggest pool in Northern California. You can swim your traditional 25 yards across it, or 50 yards the length of it. It is great. It holds 880 gallons of water. This is the Graf Zeppelin. This is the Hindenburg of swimming pools. It was great. I got out and I rode over the bump to the JCCSF, the Jewish Community Center of San Francisco. Now, this is interesting because originally and for years, they had this wonderful building and it was designed by the master architect, Arthur Brown. Look at it from 1933. He's the guy who built City Hall. He is a genius, yeah? But they didn't like it. They thought it was too small, so it was destroyed and they built a completely new structure. Oh, such a glorious pool this is. Oh, from 2001 by architect Lev Weisbach of Gensler. Look at that, the new JCCSF pool. And it has all these other pools around it, like whirlpools and, and, and saunas. I mean, Schwitz, you know, it's, got, it's, like, it's, it's like an entertainment center, this place. It is great. And then I rode into the old army base. I parked my bike, I got off, I showed my card, and I dove into the Presidio YMCA pool, the Letterman pool. Nobody knows who built this. You know, it was built by some army officer. They don't get credit for anything. They just build stuff and then move on. Orders, orders, orders. Yeah. Look at that with those huge walls and all this light coming in through the clear story windows. Just natural light, a spectacular pool. And look at the mural there. Oh my God, this totally stubbly army guy doing like a tall one. Like, what an inspiring pool that is. Then I got back on my bike, rode back over Pacific Heights to Geary Boulevard. Got off my bike, paid my full dollars, and dove into the Hamilton pool. Oh, this pool has the architect with the best name ever. His name is William Gladstone Merchant. I love it, from the mid-30s. And they've installed these, like, pool slides. I mean... The pool is supposed to be like educational and make you like athletic and it's supposed to be all serious. They put in pool slides. It's great. The best pool ever. And then I rode over Pacific Heights again. And now I was jazzed. The Michael River had me going. Best day ever. I got off my bike. I didn't pay anything because I was diving into San Francisco Bay. Aquatic park. Oh, it is great. You're swimming, you breathe, you see the Balcutha, the, the JC Thayer, you see Alcatraz, you see the Golden Gate Bridge, you see Ghirardelli Square, you see Marin, Mount Tam. Oh, the pool with the view, the bay. Yeah, it was cold, but who cares? And you know what? If you want to pay, you can join the Dolphin Club. Yeah, their building was built in 1897. Nobody knows who built it. It's been added to, it's subtracted, it's been moved three times. I got back on my bike and I rode up Columbus Avenue. I got off, I paid my $4 and I dove into, yes, the North Beach Pool. Oh, with those huge windows. 
Again, views of the city. You're in the middle of San Francisco swimming. It's glorious. This was designed again by that guy with the great name, William Gladstone. Yes, merchant in the 1930s. And then it was expanded by our favorite from Sava Pool. Yes, Paulette Taggart in 2007. She put in those glorious windows. Oh, what a gem of a pool. I loved it. I got out and I rode over to Chinatown. I parked my bike. I got off, I flashed my card, and I went into the Chinatown YMCA. Look at that building from 1925. I love it. Because you know what? It's got that really kitschy, look at that right there, that really kitschy Chinese Victorian gate on it. Ugh, what a glorious building. And inside, the cutest pool on the planet. You feel like just like a rich, spoiled child in this pool. It is so intimate and sweet and nice. I got back on my bike and I rode down to the Embarcadero. To my favorite pool on the planet. Yes, I flashed my card and there it was, the Embarcadero YMCA, my home pool where I'd done all my swimming. Look at that building. Isn't that the greatest building of all time? I love it. It's right there on the bay. It has this great view of the Bay Bridge. It's spectacular. Designed by Frederick Mayer in 1924. He wasn't even trained as an architect. He just studied with the best. And on the second floor, who knew? A swimming pool with great views. If you do the weights, you have a view of the bay. You have a billion dollar view. It is wonderful, my pool. I just love it. Then I got back on my bike and rode up Market Street. I stopped, I got off, and I walked into one of the swankest hotels on the West Coast. Yes, the Four Seasons, designed by Gary Edward. Handel and Associates in 2001. Oh my God, I felt so important. I felt like, like a master of the universe. And I walked up, I said, I'd like to swim in the pool. They said, are you a member? I said, no, 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 but I'll just pay to swim in the pool. And they said, um, you can't do that. I said, oh yeah, just, no, no, I just want to pay to swim. One, one pay, you know, just, you know, I'll, I'll pay, you know, maybe 20 bucks, 25, it's fine. And the woman behind the counter said, no, you can't do that. I said, well, how do I swim in the pool? You join. I said, well, I'm not, I'm like, I joined to swim once. And she said, well, there is another thing you can do. You can do any one of these things and I will also give you pool privileges. And she handed me a menu, like I'm in a restaurant. And it was all these like aerobics and trainings and things like that. And I was like, I don't wanna do any of these things. So I found the cheapest one, a massage for 85 bucks. I said, uh, so if I get an $85 massage, I can swim in the pool? She said, yeah. I said, but I don't want an $85 massage. She said, well, you can pay for the $85 massage and then go see the massage people and then they can give you permission to use the pool. I was like, okay, all right. I wanted to finish the River Michael. So I actually gave her one of my credit cards and paid $85. I felt like I had to do it to complete my mission. <sighs> they let me in. It was like, it was like, it was unbelievable in there. It was like a hospital, but a hospital for like, you know, I don't know, Snow White, Cinderella. I mean, it's just like a fantasy hospital. So I go into the massage room and they're like, oh, welcome for your massage. I said, I don't really want a massage. I just want you to give me permission so I can swim. They're like, why? And I said, well, I'm just... I'm trying to swim the Michael River and they're like this confused look on their face. I said, could you just give me permission to swim? They said, okay, but one day, please come back and get your massage. I've never gone back and gotten my massage. They gave me permission. I dove into their pool. What a stinky little pool for $85. The lanes were like this wide. You could barely fit in them. It wasn't all that great. Yuck. I was so disappointed. Boom, 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 boom. I got out and I rode farther up Market Street. Oh, I stopped, I got off, and I walked into the Marriott Marquis from 1989, Ziedler Architects. I hate this building. I think it's so ugly, but it has a pool in it. So I walked up to the front desk. I'm like, boy, oh boy, here we go. Another 85 bucks. Jeez. I said, I, I want to swim in your pool. Uh, how much is it going to cost? And he said, well, um, if you're not staying here, it costs 20 bucks. I'm like, really? That's great. That's a bargain. He said, yeah, just go downstairs and, and pay the uh, pool attendant and uh, he'll give you a locker and you can swim. I was like, oh, <laughs> great. And I went downstairs 
and I couldn't find a pool attendant. There was none visible. Nobody. I looked everywhere. It was like an empty space except for this pool. There was like, there was nothing going on. I was like, oh, well. So I just swam for free. And as I walked out of the Marriott Marquis, I thought, what a beautiful building. What handsome architecture. I'm so impressed. I'm going to patronize Marriott from now on. Boom, boom, boom. I got back on my bike and I rode to the mission. I got on my bike. I paid my small fee and I walked into the mission pool. Oh my God, look at that from 1916, covered with murals. What a glorious building it is. And they have an outdoor pool, the only public outdoor pool in San Francisco. Oh, it was so charming. For four bucks, I thought this is a bargain. They used to call it the nickel pool in the 1930s. That's what it cost to go swim there. So I swam my lap, boom, boom, boom. I got out and I rode over the bump to Mission Bay. I was so excited, my last, Cool. Uh, and the best. I got off my bike. I was down on the UCSF Mission Bay campus and I walked to the community center. Oh, a massive palace, gloriously designed by our favorite architect, Ricardo Legoretta in 2005. Wow. And I went up and what a pool. Unbelievable. Look at that. It's like you're in a Mayan temple. It is incredible. I felt like I was in the Yucatan. Look at that. It was glorious. And nobody was swimming. It was all like young doctors in love, you know, in speedos and bikinis all laying in the sun. I was like, I dove in. I swam and swam. Oh, uh, in the middle of San Francisco. And he, he's so clever. He designed it so it's like it's hot. I don't know how. In the middle of San Francisco, there's no wind. There's no cold. It's like always hot at Ricardo Ligarena's pool. It is incredible. Oh, what a place to finish. And I got out and I just lay in the sun. And you know, in John Cheever's story, the swimmer, Nettie Merrill slowly finds out that his life is a disaster and that the house he's headed to, his house is actually boarded up. He's lost his money, his daughter, his wife. And I just lay there thinking about all the wonderful things I had and how I'd lost nothing. I just added to it with all this glorious swimming and all this glorious architecture. I'd done it. I'd swum the Michael River. And I got out of the pool, boom, boom, boom. I got on my bike and I rode over to Potrero Hill, right nearby to the theater. And I went inside, unlocked the door, and I touched up the set. The set had been kind of beaten up for two weeks and I sort of, did some paint and some work around on the set. And when I was done, I got back on my bike and I rode home. I was so energized. I was learning about exercise. The more you do, the more you can do, the more you want to do. And I got home and I walked into our apartment and I kissed Michael. And that day had not been the end of the world. The sword of Damocles had not fallen. In fact, it had like flown away. I'd done it. I felt great. The things that had sustained me, the things that had sustained me were Michael, the swimming, and the theater. And on Wednesday, we got back together again for the next performance. And I was worried about the actors. I didn't know, you know, how they'd be. And to this day, I don't even know if they ever read that review, but they all just walked in happy to be doing the show again. And we had another great performance on a Wednesday night. And I didn't say anything. I just congratulated them. And I sat there smiling, walking and watching them walk through the door and all their personalities and thinking, oh, wow, look at that. I got that on stage. I got that on stage too. And I'm like, mm, I didn't get that. Well, maybe next time, or maybe they'll put it in as the run goes on. And we had a wonderful run with that show. And it wasn't the best opening night of all time, but for some reason, it all worked out anyway, because they're such a good group. And word got around, they invited their friends, they always gave good shows, and we never had a weird audience again. You know, years later, uh, 
somebody I knew from college came and saw a show of mine. I was talking to her afterwards and she was telling me about how she'd been teaching at the university. She taught there and I said, oh, wow, yeah, I've taught there too. And she said, yeah, I, I did my assignment. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you know, I, I did my two years of teaching there. I said, wow, did something happen? She said, no, 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 those, that's all they do. Those assignments are just two-year assignments. They don't usually go beyond that. It's very rare that they do. And I never realized that. Here this whole time, I'd assumed it was my fault. I'd done this wrong and that wrong. I'd overexposed myself. When in fact, it's just a two-year assignment. I hadn't done anything wrong. I'd just done my maximum time. And in fact, those summer schools, I guess, were kind of an extension. I guess in spite of everything, somebody up there liked me. Well, I think of it this way. If all that hadn't happened, and I hadn't thought about it the way I did, I probably wouldn't have gone swimming. And now I've got swimming. And in preparing this piece, oh, I came across all this great stuff. Open water swimmers, people who swim 67 hours without sleep on Lake Champlain, people who swim back and forth across the channel four times. I really recommend all this open water swimming podcast. Sarah Thomas, she's amazing. She had breast cancer, she recovered, and then she swam four times back and forth across the channel without sleep. She's gone 67 hours without sleep. And also, also some amazing sociological things about how minority groups a lot couldn't swim, could never learn how to swim because they weren't allowed in pools during the 40s and 50s. Or they could only swim one day on Sundays at the end of the week when the water was dirty and then it was cleaned on Monday. Swimming is amazing. It's a return to something. And it's a willful return because I learned that mammals all know how to swim. They all naturally swim. You throw a bat into the water. You throw any kind of a mammal into the water, it will do some awful swim, but it will swim. You throw a human in the water, it will panic and drown. And I think that's another reason why it's so glorious, because it's something we don't know how to do. And yet we figure it out and we do it. And in that way, I think it's like theater. If we didn't do it, it wouldn't happen. I think that's special. It's something beyond the natural. It's taking the impulse and forcing it to happen. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is John Fisher, and this has been The Swimmer. You were a great audience tonight. I do feel the audience out there. I see the little green light, and I can feel the audience. And so this piece about live theater very much feels like a live performance for me. You've been so great in supporting our theater company. You've kept us going. If you'd like to uh, make a donation to our theater to support this program, we'd certainly appreciate it. We're having a very tough time now during COVID-19, as I'm sure you can imagine. You can send a donation to me at my COVID-19 work address, John Fisher, Theater Rhino 91 Central Avenue, Suite, number 102, San Francisco, California, 94117. Or you can go on our website, and go to donate and donate through PayPal. Any way you want to help us would be great. But more than anything, thank you for being such a terrific audience. We have a bunch of great programs coming up. We have a reading of a great play, Bright Half-Life, coming up uh, the first Tuesday in Joe's reading series. Let's give a big shout out to Joe along the way who keeps this theater going. No longer am I alone in the office by any means or online. Yay, Joe, yay! So that'll be part of Joe's reading series uh, the first Tuesday in May. And then we have Mark Nadler coming with Gay As They Say about how all those great lyricists who sounded gay really were communicating gay lyrics to us. Uh, Cole Porter, um, uh, Lawrence Hart. You wanna check that out. That's gonna be on May 21st to the 23rd. You can go online and sign up for all these programs. They're free, we'd love it if you donated, but we just want you to come and enjoy theater. But more than anything, thank you for being with me tonight and have a safe one. Yay!